Professor Meltzer, on behalf of the Geneva Academy, thank you very much to agreeing to do this interview. Uh, so I'll start with a, with a few general questions and then let's see uh, where we take this uh, onward. So my first question to you today will be uh, regarding your career path. So what were the defining factors in your career that led to your current position? And what recommendations do you have for somebody pursuing a similar career? Um. Maybe I should start by saying that I never wanted to become an international lawyer. I wanted to become an astronaut. And uh, as you can see, I've been very successful at it. So I don't know whether I'm a good example uh, for the students. Because it depends on how you define success. Is success is usually defined as the ability of achieving a result that you already planned. In that sense, I'm not very successful. Um, Winston Churchill has defined it differently. He basically said that success is stumbling from failure to failure without losing your motivation. Um, I think I'd define it even in a third way. I'd say that success is the ability, or will come, with the ability to trust. To trust in the unknown and to discover your life rather than actually planning it. Because when you plan your life, you will limit it by your imagination. You will not be able to achieve more than you can imagine. And if you discover it, you'll discover possibilities that you've never even dreamed of. And I think that's certainly what happened with me. I started out wanting to become an astronaut, but I was bad at math, I was bad at natural science, chemistry, I did, wasn't interested in geology, you know, looking at moon rocks. All I wanted is to stand on the moon and look at the Earth and see the whole planet, how it rotates and how there is no political borders, the beauty and the vulnerability of it. And that image I've carried along and have discovered a life path that allows me to see that every single moment without, without even having to fly there. Because that's the perspective I have on the world. So you would say a bit that uh, working in the human rights sector is a bit like looking at the earth from the moon? Yes, certainly. Or I think you need that perspective and sometimes also that distance because when you go close up it becomes very painful and so you have to be able to take that distance and see the beauty of it all um, uh, in order to keep up your motivation. Thank you very much for that. Uh, now a question about your mandate. Uh, so a special rapporteur uh, against torture uh, how, how well developed would you say is the international legal framework for the eradic eradication of torture and CIDT? Oh, it is it's a brilliant framework. Uh, now, the rule of law requires several things. It requires a framework. It requires that you have uh, the normative requirement. That you have the norms that actually tell you what is prohibited, what is allowed, and, 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 and how to determine that. And in that sense, the legal framework is perfect. But we all know that that's not sufficient, because you also need to implement it. And that framework, that governance system is virtually non-existent. We have an implementation framework or bodies that are tasked to implement that prohibition, the Human Rights Committee, the, Convention against, the Committee Against Torture, uh, even the International Court of Justice or the National Courts uh, to some extent. But by and large, it doesn't work. So there we have a huge implementation gap, or a huge discrepancy between the declared political intentions of states and the actual practice. Indeed, but in your reports, nevertheless, you do focus on some, some issues which are maybe more closely related to the framework, such as domestic violence. So what, do you think that this is nevertheless still an implementation issue rather than a, a normative issue? Well, I would say in this particular case, um, the implementation gap is so huge that states prefer not to look at it as torture. Because if it were, they would have to declare complete failure. Um, and I was shocked myself when I started investigating the topic of domestic violence and I realized that statistically even the tip of the tip of the iceberg that we know of domestic violence, because the vast majority of cases will never come to the surface, 
So maybe that 1% we're aware of amounts to more death and injury than is caused by all armed conflicts taken together in a given period of time. So that's huge. If you look at 70,000 women killed by their family in a year, and we haven't looked yet at the ones that were never reported, the ones that get raped, the ones that get beaten, the ones that get expelled, the ones that get tortured, forced into prostitution, trafficked, and then the children, and then obviously thousands of men as well are, are suffering that. And that's just to say that's domestic violence that no one ever even considers when talking about torture. But some of these practices clearly involve the same type of suffering. And you add to that police violence, you add br police brutality in all types of contexts. You add to that intentional use of torture in interrogation. And you, you add to that the inhumane detention conditions in migration centers and the systematic discrimination against marginalized groups. And what you end up with is a species that is extremely violent. And I think we, we have to recognize that we are not yet where we believe we are, that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is an ambition, is a goal, but we're nowhere near that yet. Now, uh, along these lines, how do you see your role? How do you see the, the impact of special procedures, of your own mandate, of, of soft law instruments, if you will, in, in human rights? Uh, in general, can, have you been able to uh, at some point say, well, I can now feel a palpable consequence, a positive result of what I've been doing uh, as, a, as the Special Rapporteur? The reality is very difficult. Um, I've had this mandate now for four years and I'm now currently engaging in a state consultation to evaluate the collaboration of states with my mandate. Now the Human Rights Council when establishing my mandate has asked all states to fully cooperate with my mandate, to provide answers to all of my questions, to give me access to all of their places of detention, and to provide me with all other support uh, needed to fulfill my mandate. So that's a high standard. And so now I, I, my next report to the Human Rights Council will actually evaluate that statistically over four years. I don't want to give precise numbers yet because we still need to, to actually calculate these things, but uh, by and large my estimation is that about one third of my interventions for individual cases, we're talking about 300 per year, about 100 don't receive any response whatsoever. Of the other 200, less than five have a fully uh, satisfactory response. Just, that's an estimation. So that's a very frustrating reality um, to deal with. I think that uh, I want to put a mirror in front of the states and say, look, you've created my mandate, and it's, it's easy to declare the prohibition of torture and to congratulate me every year for my work. But when I write to you, you don't respond, or you s respond in a way that denies the facts, denies your responsibility, or denies the wrongfulness of what you're doing. And in less than five of 200, so we're talking around two, three percent max, I receive a fully constructive response. That's not, you know, the kind of success rate you would like to have with a heart surgeon or a, a airplane pilot, you know. So I think we need to seriously work on state self-perception and how they think they're actually implementing these norms. But So uh, my next question was going to be on the challenges of working uh, with states, but it, it seems to me you, you paint a somewhat bleak picture of, of reality. Uh, would you say that maybe there are some positive aspects to all of this? Uh, well, if you look at where we were 5,000 years ago, where torture was absolutely in everyday practice, 
slavery was part of the legal system, and genocide, uh, you know, you, was basically committed by heroes. Right? So I think we've come a long way. But if we look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, even at the UN Charter, we're just about as far away from achieving that standard as we're now uh, far away from that reality 10,000 years ago. Now, the, the important thing is, it's not a moral issue. I've just submitted my current report to the UN General Assembly on what I call biopsychosocial -so factors conducive to torture. So I've worked with uh, social psychologists, with neurobiologists, to analyze human decision making, especially, especially also collective human decision making, and, and how, the, how far this deviates from our belief that decision making is rational and moral. Science proves that the majority of decision making of human beings is governed by our emotions. And it's subconscious. So we're taking our decisions before we even become conscious of them. And in our consciousness, we then rationalize them by reference to the norms that are generally ex expected. But it's a form of self-delusion. And that's not because there are bad intentions. It's just the way we function. It assured our compliance with the group's expectation as cavemen so we would survive. It's just that a caveman's mentality is not suited for the 21st century. We've realized that in science, when we build an airplane or a bridge, we have learned to exclude human bias. In politics and in our economic system, we are still operating according to a caveman's operating system. And it yields the same results. It's brutal, it's exploitative, and it's violent. But we can change it. If we can build a rocket that f brings people to the moon, we have to exclude the human bias. If we can do that, we can also build a governance system that can bring us to the target of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But we have to have transparency, we have to have oversight to control human bias, self-interest. Um, this is a technical issue. We should distance ourselves from condemnation and idealization and patriotism and all these you know, biased types of perceptions and realize we're just human beings, we're all the same, we're all biased by nature, we're not going to change that. This is our input. Now here is what we want to achieve. It's a mathematical equation. If from here you want to get to there, to the human rights respect, a just, humane and sustainable society, you need a governance system that can actually produce that. And this we don't have today. Thank you, that was inspiring. Uh, now a question on, on communications from victims. So as Special Rapporteur, I know for a fact that you, that you receive many and probably on a daily basis. So are, are you able, how many of these are you actually able to, to deal with? And uh, if you are not able to deal with all of them, how do you make priorities? How do you decide, I will deal with this case, I will not deal with, uh, with this other case? No, I cannot deal with all the requests I get. I get about 10 to 15 requests per day and I can deal with one, maximum two. So it's around one in 10. And as I said, of the two or 300, maybe five are satisfactory in the responses. So these two or 300 correspond to 3,000 requests. So we're in the area of a pro mil or so uh, of, of satisfactory requests. But this is a question of the resources I have. And I simply, I have two people working for me maximum, sometimes for many months only one, and we have to deal with all these requests, we have to organize country visits, we have to prepare thematic reports, uh, so it's just not feasible to do more than that. And that too is a question of how serious are states about these commitments when they create a mandate and congratulate each other for doing that, but then don't provide the resources so we can actually do the work. 
And, and how do you prioritize uh, so these one or two out of 15? Unfortunately, it's a bit like a war surgeon. Uh, I look at the cases and I see, well, which one can I still save? So I'm looking at the preventative ones first, where I can still prevent torture from happening. People that are about to be extradited to a country where they're likely to be tortured. People that have been sentenced to corporal punishment or to the death penalty. So I try to intervene there. Cases that have already led to torture, I do as many as I can, but uh, it's, it's, it's not the first priority will always be the life-saving ones and the preventative ones. Now, a question on your vision, if you will, of changing the world. This is something that you, you discuss, you mention in your, your uh, lectures. So for you, what would it mean to change the world? And do you think that international lawyers or human rights lawyers uh, can do this? Well, let me start in reverse order. We can't do it alone. We're indispensable for it because we will create the rules and the principles of the governance system that will actually bring us there where we want to be. As I've explained before, we need to change the world. If we, if we have already, after the Second World War, defined the destination. We said we want a peaceful world governed by human rights and, and fair relations between, uh, 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 between peoples and obviously today also environmental sustainability is extremely important. So let's say we want a humane, just and sustainable world order. That We have the constitution for that or the destination in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in the UN Charter. We have the human being as they have always been. We are not capable to do that by nature. So now we have to design that governance system. That's changing the world. And this is why we need young lawyers who actually think about this. Have the courage to think outside this box of this current system that is failing before our eyes and say, how can we do it better? It's not. If you allow a president without any oversight and in secrecy to do whatever they want, in behind closed doors, then his human factor will take over and he will become corrupt. Power corrupts if it's not controlled. It's not his fault. We created the wrong system. It's not about replacing that person and put someone else there who has the same operating system who will again become corrupted. What we need is not a savior, but we have to change the system to guide people and to have that oversight uh, and to make sure that in the end uh, it becomes a government for the people um, and not the people serving the government. We have one last question to, to conclude this interview. Do you have any, any tips, any advice that you would give young prospective human rights lawyers? Yes, never strive for functions. Never attach yourself to functions. Once you have them, attach yourself to your integrity. If you remain attached to your integrity, you cannot lose anything. If you lose the function, it is to save your integrity, and you take that with you into your next function. If you lose your integrity on the way, no function in the world can save you. Professor Meltzer, thank you very much. On behalf of the Geneva Academy, it has been a privilege to host you today. Thank you for your questions. Mm -hmm.